So this is the cystic fibrosis trust in the UK. So this is the equivalent to cystic fibrosis Australia. This is our national charity. Mm -hmm. uh, and what they have recently published, and I think it's an important quote, and that is to deliver optimum care to those with cystic fibrosis is absolutely essential that the microbiology of each individual is fully understood. Therapeutic decision making and infection prevention and control practices depending on the body. The role of the microbiology laboratory has never been more important than CF care. So CF and CF microbiology is, is, is an important issue to know what the bugs are, what the ramifications for the management of those bugs are, for issues of treatment, for issues of infection control. Next slide. Okay, so in terms of cystic fibrosis, uh, adults, we've got 300 in the adult hospital, Belfast City Hospital, and we've roughly 250 children in the Royal Belfast Hospital for, for sick children. And they will normally transition at about 16 to 18 years, depending on the child and the environment and the circumstances. Uh, and we've got a, we have a big emphasis on transition. We've got one of our adult physicians is very uh, big into transition and transition science and transition medicine, making sure that that's a very seamless link between the children's hospital and the big hospital. Biology important in cystic fibrosis. So if anyone's got any questions at any time, just please read the shout out and stop, and we'll take the question, and uh, then we can go back to the talk. Okay, next slide please. Well, microbiology, and this is kind of the, the mystery box phenomenon. So you're all familiar with this here, you know, sticky, purulent, uh, the freshly expectorated sputum. So what we have, what you will find is you, you'll, you'll, your child or yourself or your, your, your CF adult friend or care, you know, will produce the sputum and then miraculously there'll, there'll be a microbiology report sent. But it's this bit in the middle that not many people understand. It's this black box thing. You know, what goes on in the black box? And that's what I'm trying hopefully to elucidate and give you a little bit of insight into it. Sometimes patients would say to me, I don't really understand this microbiology. Perhaps I can come down to the microbiology lab and have a look around and see my student. Absolutely not, you know. We can't, have you, we can't have you in the microbiology lab because in that lab we're probably generating trillions of bugs per day and we're probably a, a purveyors of mass genocide because we kill millions of bugs per day. You know, I'm surprised we haven't taken up for war crimes or something. Uh, because we, we, you know, we, we, we produce thousands and thousands of eggs or plates each day. So the last place I want you running around is the microbiology laboratory. You know, we're trying to keep you infection free, not actually give you infection. Not that we, there was a bigger risk of, of, of infection because we were all, ex the, the workers were all exposed to plates each day, but we take certain precautions to, to mitigate the risks even to the laboratory technicians. So it's this bit in the middle. Because then what will happen is once the doc gets the microbiology report, then they'll phone you or they'll contact you and say, look, uh, we've got a new bug, come in, we'd have to start antibiotics, for example, the pseudomonas. We'd have to start you up on antibiotics, what does that mean? What it might mean is you come to a different clinic on a different day, uh, because now you are pseudomonas, which you weren't before. Uh, you might have to start taking nebulized antibiotics at home every day, like tobramycin or colostin or zithromycin. There's, there's lots of other ones, new ones coming along, like uh, nebulized levofloxacin. Uh, so it's a big change, you know, if the microbiology, there's something new on the sheet here. This is what you want, you want a clean microbiology report. Uh, you want to stay at this, like this for as long as possible. Now, when, it's, when it says microbiology report nothing, of course that's not the truth because the lungs aren't sterile, you know. What it means is microbiology report blank. What that means is there's no bugs there that we think cause a problem. Of course our lungs are always full of bugs. Even healthy people, the lungs aren't sterile, but we've got ways of actually mitigating infection with lots of defenses and sort of natural uh, immune responses which don't work in the CF lung. Uh, and this is also, if we find something new, does it mean that it's a, it's a nasty bug? Probably we don't know, unless it's one of the, the classical old fashioned bugs like Staph aureus or Pseudomonas or Stenotrophomonas or Aspergillus or things like that. Next slide, please. So, then here comes the microbiology lab. Next slide, please. So, it's, it is so microbiology, it's the laboratory science that helps elucidate infection. 
So infection microbiology kind of goes it's like a, it's like a strawberries and cream. So here we've got the science, which is microbiology, and the science then gives the evidence to help discuss and talk about infections. Uh, sometimes, and then infections are part of, so sort of holistically, the whole CF disease along with pancreatic insufficiency and all those other, all those issues, other issues associated with cystic fibrosis. So historically, then you know we've got microbiologists pointing to what part of the world you're in. Good America, then you've got infection control doctors, and they manage the infection, or the CF physicians manage the infection. But there is a very, very close linkage between infection and microbiology. Next slide, please. And why is this why is microbiology important? Because this was this is a quite an old slide now, and things have moved on, thankfully. But the UK CF Trust newsletter published this uh, way back in the, the, the early noughties. And that was infections important because it does, there is a correlation between infection and life expectancy. So, for example, with no significant bugs, and this is way back in the noughties, we, we've moved on probably a bit from there, no significant bugs with cystic fibrosis, they also probably depend on the type of mutation you had, whether you got infections or not, life expectancy 50 years. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, that's probably going up a bit now, but it's probably a bit on the low side, and if you've got pseudomonas. And also remember that every pseudomonas is not the same. So, uh, with an awful lot of other diseases, you, people, medicine tries to cohort people. But that's risky because not, there's like 256 gray shades of pseudomonas aeruginosa. So you can't say, oh, well, I can mix with you because you've got pseudomonas, I've got pseudomonas, we're all in this together. Well, no, we're not all in this together because there's, it's like I was saying to Julie earlier on, it's like saying, I've got a dog. Uh, what's your dog? Well, I've got the cutest little chihuahua. You know, he smiles, he's got blue teeth, he's an absolute treat. And what's your dog? I've got this sort of rock fine, that's got fangs three inches long. We've all, both of us have got a dog. So that's the way it is with pseudomonas. Both of us have got pseudomonas. So they're really good ones. There's not just, there's not just think that's, that's a wrong one. There's not just things a good one. There's just a lesser bad ones, if you like. Not like so, Pseudomonas, and then the body of all here is uh, Burkholderia sinocapacia. Um, the other big thing then for lay people is, gosh, these are big words, big names. You know, where do they all come from? So, for example, with Burkholderia, it used to be called, in the literature you'd still see it's just called Capacia. So, Burkholderia used to be Pseudomonas. Burkholderia was named after a guy called Walter Burkholder. So, if you're really famous in microbiology, it's when you die, they, 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 they call you, they call the dog after you. <laughs> Burkholderia, named after uh, Joseph, uh, uh, Walter, sorry, Walter Burkholder, who was a plant pathologist in Cornell University in New York. And in 1949, the onion crop failed in New York State. And it's failed because of a slimy rot disease. All the onions became very slippery and slimy, and everything had to bend. And the reason for this slimy disease in the onions was due to a, a gram-negative bacteria, which was then called Pseudomonas capacia. And if you are Greek and Latin scholars, and these are all Greek and Latin names, Kaipa in Greek means onion. So it, it came from Kaipa, here, it here. It came from onions. So these are both soil organisms found in the rhizosphere of the soil. The important thing here is that with this bug, life expectancy is much reduced because this is a much more aggressive uh, organism. Next slide, please. Now, some new kids in the block, and that is fungi. Fungi have been having a bit of a renaissance. Physicians and pediatricians are now becoming, microbiologists are now becoming more and more interested in fungal and fungal disease. Mainly due to two, these two uh, organisms here. The first one is Aspergillus. You can get an allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, so an allergic type in fungal disease where you become very wheezy and your chest becomes very tight, you drop your lung function. And then this other thing called Scatosporia, a fungal disease. And there's another one, there's, there's a lot of information and concern about it about several years ago. And the fungus called Axophyella dermatitidis. There was a paper published from the University of Ljubljana in Slovenia, and where they found this was in dishwashers. 
found all of this fungus in dishwashers. Of course, I put the that set this that, 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 the CF community into sort of spin as to was this to stop using the dishwasher? I said absolutely not. Don't stop using the dishwasher. Was it the alternative? You stop using the dishwasher. Really, even though this fungus is important, it's just it's an environmental thing. We find it. Uh, what's the danger if you stop using dishwashers? If you stop using dishwashers, then you're going to wash the dishes in lukewarm water, and everything's going to get mixed up. And you're going to set them on the drain board, and you're going to get all contaminated. That's not a good idea. So what you do is my advice would be to keep using the dishwasher. And sorry, guys, you know, for a non-carbon friendly approach to things, but none of this sort of wishy-washy, you know, watered down dilute. Let's wash it at 15 degrees thing. You turn that dishwasher up to boil. You know, boil that thing as much as it will go. You push it because these ground negatives do not like being boiled. You know, all this, I'm a bit nervous about all of this sort of let's wash it 15 degrees thing because, uh, okay, it's probably very good for carbon and carbon footprints, but the bugs can have a field day here because we're not washing it with equal temperature. Next, next slide, please. Okay, so prognostic factors for eight year mortality and clinical status after eight year follow up with children with <coughs> safe ages. So basically, what, what this says is that pseudomonas status, pseudomonas is not a good bug to have with cystic fibrosis. Uh, depending on whether you're, uh, if you're culture negative or if you've got no cultures. Because what, what will the fact will affect hospitalization rates, you can see here, double roughly, for not having it. Uh, your predicted FEV1 will go down as well as your weight percentile. So knowing uh, that you've got pseudomonas is not a good idea. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to keep people pseudomonas free for as long as possible. And that's the big challenge. Uh, because once we get it sometimes, it can, be, it can creep in and remain chronically in our lungs, even after we start to try to eradicate it. And we, we start with, with various eradication mechanisms like uh, taking oral ciprofloxacin for three months or six months, along with nebulized colomycin. The Americans use nebulized tobramycin. So not only have you got the bug, but it's going to be a major change to your, your daily lifestyle because you've got this bug table, <coughs> which is something new. So this is going to be in addition to your bronchodilators and your pull design with your bronchitol or your hypertonic cell. So this is not good news, even just for your day-to-day -day living, because you've got something extra to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. And also, uh, in terms of the genotype, that's very important. You all probably are aware of the types of mutations that are involved with CFTR uh, and the different classes of that. Is it class 1, is it a class 2, is it a class 3? And I think we're now in class 6, six class 6 mutation, where you've got a lot of instability of the CFTR protein on the surface, or is it a, a, a class mutation which is like a gating mutation? Hence, again, my, my, my reason for coming is to help with the scientific understanding of because some people might say, well, I've got cystic fibrosis, uh, and why aren't you giving me the likes of Ibicaptor? Because we know Ibicaptor won't work because you've got the right mutation. <clears throat> what does that mean? So it's, it's telling to tell them, it's getting the patients to understand what different mutations mean to them. This is really high-end, personalized or precision medicine. Because these new CFTR uh, drugs will not work for everyone. The ideal, I think the ideal thing is to develop you know, but the ideal thing is gene editing, so we have to make our mutation completely. But until we get to that, what we're trying to do is we're trying to look for CFTR mutations. And we, we find molecules with either characters or potentials that cover most of the, uh, I don't think we'll ever get the stage that we'll be able to cover all, but certainly we could never be up in the 90% plus range of some of these neural molecules with the likes of the CFTR or can be or the IV capture. What we see here is that if you've got a little bit of residual CFTR function, then that makes a big change for the types of bugs you get. So if you've got a very, very uh, benign, uh, would say silent mutation, but a mutation where the phenotype is, is a lot less marked, then the chances are you're not going to see a lot of chronic chest infections where you're going to have to go in every three months or six months when you're an adult to have IV antibiotics. Your disease is going to be more based on the pancreatic insufficiency. You're just going to have to manage your pancreatic insufficiency. Make sure you take your pre on things like that there. So that's a big issue in terms of, but if you've got delta 8 508 
delta F5 away to homozygous, then the chances are you will get pseudomonas aeruginosa, and then you'll get into that whole sort of cure pathway trying to deal with your pseudomonas aeruginosa. Or you pick up other bugs on route like Burkholderia or Chromobacter or some, there's a whole lot of them, or even a deep fungus. Next slide.